very welcome to uh, this seminar. Um, I think I know most of you, uh, it's one or two. I'm Daniel Slunge, I'm um, working at the FRAM Center for Chemical Risk Assessment and Management. And we are several here in the room who are related to that center, but not all. Uh, but uh, in this uh, today, uh, in this seminar, we are very happy to have uh, Christoph Reinberger here from the European Chemicals Agency. Um, he's a regulatory economist working with uh, the socioeconomic analysis that you need to do in order to, um, if you are asking to get an authorization to continue to use a substance of very high concern. And um, it's also a background from Toulouse School of Economics and Harvard Center for Health and something. Health Decision Science. Health Decision Science. Uh, so, uh, we've been working on some uh, things before and uh, we're very happy to have had the opportunity now to have more discussions here during the, these two days. So, um, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for the invite and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Before I start, I should uh, officially declare that all the views that are expressed in this presentation are uh, my views and do not necessarily represent official positions of the European Chemicals Agency. So now that that formality is clear, I'm going to present some joint work with Greta Franke, who is a consultant at uh, one of the consultancies who prepare these applications for authorization. And I'm going to tell you more about that in, in this talk. Um, it was not super easy for me to prepare because I didn't know exactly what the background of the audience will be. So. If I'm going too fast, if I assume too much of your pre-knowledge, please let me know and I can explain in more detail things. It's very difficult also, sometimes we are quite blind because we, we know our business quite well and we have uh, limited understanding that people outside the, the, the bubble of reach do not necessarily always know exactly what chemicals regulation in Europe implies. So, so if there's something I should be uh, explaining, or if you have questions, uh, please uh, don't wait until the end, just uh, raise your hand and we will take them as we go. Okay? All right, so the motivation for this uh, paper that I'm going to present today is, uh, is, is actually something which has been well observed in the literature, in the environmental economics literature, so wherever you have this environment, health and safety regulations, because um, firms may not comply with the regulatory standards and it is quite difficult and quite costly for the regulator to ensure that they actually do. And so dating back to this uh, very influential paper by Gary Becker in 1968, um, there is a, a growing stream of, of literature and, and Becker in that paper proposed probabilistic enforcement campaigns in order to deter misbehavior and to restrict harmful externalities at a socially optimal cost. So you don't want to kind of control everybody. It's sufficient if you uh, do samples, but if you find somebody in violation, you have to punish them in order to uh, signal to the others that they better comply, right? And so around that idea, there has been uh, optimal deterrence and sanctioning uh, idea in the literature and that has become a quite widely studied feature of environmental regulation. And so, so Gray and Shimshak and Shimshak, they, they uh, actually review the literature in quite some detail and, uh, and look into very many aspects of this. So if you are interested in following up on that, I can only recommend those sources. Um, well, Another feature which many uh, environmental health and safety regulations have is this um, reporting criterion. So firms uh, are supposed to self-report their compliance status to the regulator. And that's socially bene beneficial as it reduces the expected enforcement cost. And the idea here is very, very easy. So think, for instance, of fishermen. They typically have a quota of fish that they can catch. and, and um, so if they catch too much, 
then they can report that to the authorities and they will maybe face a, a, an administrative fee, but that will be much lower than the penalty they would face if they get caught red-handed. So in that sense, it's optimal that if you are uh, in non-compliance, for whatever reasons, to signal that to the regulator because you face a, a lower cost. Of course, whether or not you are uh, self-reporting non-compliance depends on what's the penalty and what's the probability of being caught if you're not reporting. And actually that's what uh, Malik already showed in, the, in, in this paper here. In 1993, uh, so the gains, the social gains from self-reporting depend on the relative cost of auditing and sanctioning, the accuracy of monitoring and the desired level of emission or exposure, or if you like, emission and re exposure reduction. Right. And well, since then, there have been several theoretical extensions, for instance, with regard to enforcement cost minimization. So what is it that the regulator should do optimally in order to minimize the cost of enforcement while keeping a certain compliance rate? Or another thing that has been studied quite heavily is uh, dynamic features in that repeated interaction between the regulator and the regulatee. So if you are punishing too much, the, the offenders, well, then they might stop even, uh, even reporting. So then you have to invest more in order to find them. And so it might be actually uh, optimal from the regulator's point not to be too strict in order not to chill um, reporting behavior of, of firms. And in this paper, we contribute to this stream of the literature by looking into the sanctioning within the European uh, Union's uh, registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals regulation, or in short terms, REACH. So I don't know how many of you know about REACH, but as the, the title of the, the regulation says, it's a, it's a fourfold thing. So the idea is that Firms have to register all the chemicals they are using if they are using more than a certain amount, which is one ton per year. They register that with the European Chemicals Agency. So we have this huge database. And then we use the database in order to find um, substance uses that might be of concern, so that might pose a risk to either workers or the environment or consumers. And if we spot something, then uh, those registrations will be evaluated. And the outcome of that evaluation is typically that either it is not a problem, or then it can move on towards a risk option analysis. And either it is uh, the agency or the member state uh, competent authorities who then propose uh, regulatory action on it. And that the regulatory action can be, can be different. So one possibility is that uh, you have a restriction of the chemical, which can be, for instance, a ban or a limit on the uh, content in a product or um, certain criteria that need to be in place in order to use the substance or a training, a mandatory training uh, requirement, things like that. And those are union-wide um, so that means if, if they are established, they hold in all of the now 27 European countries. Another possibility is that the substance is listed on the so-called authorization list. And that's the process that I'm going to talk about today. So the authorization system works as follows. If there is the political will to put a substance onto the uh, out, under this authorization scheme, then first it is candidate listed and identified as a, as a substance of very high concern. And then it can be promoted to this authorization list, which means there is a certain date on, uh, after which you can only use the substance if you have obtained an authorization. So it's almost like a driving license, if you like. You need to have this license in order to continue the use. Well, 
so firms have to have to basically uh, obtain this uh, authorization, and it's very important that it's a time limit authorization. So it will uh, grant you the, the the use for a specific number of years, after which you can reapply. You can obtain an authorization if you can show that first there is no suitable alternative to the substance use that you are applying for. So what you are doing is, is actually really reliant on the use of the substance. Then there is the requirement that it's socially beneficial to, to continue the use. So, so the benefits of continuing the use of the substance outweigh the risks to health and the environment. And the third criterion is that uh, the remaining risks are adequately controlled. So there is uh, uh, overall a, a, a duty holder uh, uh, idea in, in reach. So you cannot just use a, a dangerous substance like you want, but you have to implement standards, working procedures that are uh, resulting in reasonably low exposures and emissions. Yes. Is this independent of the, uh, of the tonnage? Um, yes, indeed. So the, the, this, the, the, the requirement of, 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 of due diligence is, is there no matter what and in which quantities you are using. So, so if you are just using small quantities but you are emitting all of them into the environment, that would not be allowed. I was just thinking about the threshold of one ton that you mentioned. Before, but that, is not. that is only for the registration requirement. So for these substances of very high concern, if you fall under the authorization requirement, uh, so if you are using one of these substances, and there are a number of a small number of uh, exemptions. So if it's, for instance, research and development or medical research and development, particularly, you might be exempted. But if otherwise, even if you're using only a few grams, you have to have the, uh, the, the authorization. Yeah? All right, so in this paper, we, we analyze uh, quite detailed information that was submitted as part of more than 100 applications for authorization. And we look at how has this information affected the recommendation on authorization requests. So, Maybe to give you a bit of a better uh, understanding, this is now the, the, the core uh, article from the REACH regulation mm -hmm. on authorization. And well, you can read it for yourself, but it's, it's having very many objectives in, in, uh, in only two sentences. So it's quite dense. The idea is really that you would push towards substitution of such substances where you can ensure that uh, there are viable alternatives. Um, and this applies to manufacturers, importers, and downstream users of substances. And in the authorization application, then the, the applicant should look specifically into the availability of alternatives, consider the risks of those alternatives and of the uses that they are applying for, and make an, uh, a balancing uh, between the, 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 the impacts of, of substituting away or not. And sometimes that's more easy because there are well-known alternatives, and sometimes that's uh, less easy because it's, it's technically not known what to use other than the substance that they are applying for. Well, this now is more to give you a bit of a flavor of what we look at if we make this balancing. So this is a stylized a small economy where the, the boundaries here around the pool of consumers is basically the boundaries of the European Union because this requirement is only um, valid for European or operators in the European Union. So, so if you use the substance outside the Union and then you import it into the Union, the good, uh, 
you are no longer subject to the authorization requirement. Unless, for instance, you, you, you would have done a user of the good in the union. So, for instance, we are currently looking into in vitro diagnostic kits and hospitals who would import such kits, they would become users of the substance, so they might uh, need an authorization. Okay? So, consumers, well, they basically what they do is they buy products from firms, and firms produce products, and they use some inputs, they have some labor involved, and, and that's the typical churn of the economy, right? Now, in the case of hazardous substances, first there's a worker risk, so people who are occupationally exposed may be, may be uh, exposed to substances that have uh, quite nasty impacts on them. Then it's also such that the firm may emit some pollutants into the environment and thereby negatively affect you know, the, uh, the ecosystem. Or it could be that the disposal of the, of the products could lead to, uh, to problems with, uh, with uh, pollution in the environment. Products themselves could potentially be uh, harmful to consumers. And also, um, sometimes there is, for instance, discharging uh, of substances into the air, and then it might uh, expose people via uh, the food chain, for instance. So there's all kind of exposure pathways. And sometimes there's also a kind of a green competitor. Typically, the green competitor will have some, some uh, smaller market share because either it's more expensive or the product is in some characteristic less good. Uh, that could be price, for instance. It could be more expensive to, to fabricate the same kind of good with, with uh, more benign substances. Could be other things as well. Could be durability of goods. And, and, uh, and the question is really what would happen if we would basically now no longer allow this to, to happen? So what's the economic impact on consumers? And that's what firms need to basically assess in their authorization request. But, but they, uh, as we discussed a bit in the morning, they, they assess this from their perspective, right? Because they are not looking into the macro equilibrium of the economy and effects on prices and so on. Well, they are way unprepared to be able to predict something. That is one of the problems there, indeed, that the firms have a very, very difficult time to, to imagine anything outside of their realm, right? They will tell you exactly what will happen to them if they have not the right to use the substance. Mm. But uh, adopting this, this, what economists call the social planner's view, mm. is very difficult for them. So they have problems in, in, in imagining what are the consequences and, and how would that affect their competitors, for instance. Mm. But in, in, in principle, this is what they should be doing. No, I'm not saying they are doing this necessarily. Okay. Maybe also to clarify, there is different uh, types of authorizations. So one possibility is that you have an application for authorization at this level one. So for instance, the manufacturer, importer, or only representative of a substance. So only representatives are um, shell companies, let's say shell companies that are uh, representing an, uh, a company from outside the union who are kind of ex importing this, this, this substance as, as a bulk substance into the union, they can apply for the use, uh, for their own use theoretically, and for the use of formulators. Formulators are intermediaries that, that do something with the substance. For instance, they could, uh, you know, uh, fabricate a specific solution with a uh, or a degree of purity or something like that with the substance. So they can cover one level down. 
formulators themselves, they could also um, apply for their own use and they could cover their downstream users. So if they, for instance, uh, formulate an aqueous solution with, with the substance involved, they can apply for the formulation and they can apply for the use of the downstream user who buys the substance from them to do something in the formulation, them, uh, in the production of, of, of a good. And, and finally, at the level two, you can also have the downstream user simply applying for their own use. So then they become the authorization holder and, and it's just covering their own business. So those are the, the, different, the different options. Now what happens if they want to apply? Well, as I explained, once there is the requirement, it will be announced that after a certain date you can no longer use the substance, so you should be preparing your application. And then when you have maybe maybe if you are if you are fast enough you can uh, have a, a short information session with 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 the agency to see whether you have covered all the things and then you do a submission so you submit this electronically and then uh, my colleagues they have two to three months time in order to check whether the dossier is complete and to pre prepare a, a broad information on use package, that's, that's how we call it, is basically a summary of what's, what is the applicant applying for. And then the, the applicant is, is paying an, uh, their invoice, they have to pay an administrative fee for the handling of the application. And at that moment also we publish this, this summary of their application and we say we have a public consultation which lasts for eight weeks where people could then intervene. Yes? There are several companies applying to use this, essentially the same chemical. Yeah. Do you kind of carry out some kind of coordination or is it strictly each applicant is treated separately? It's, well, if the applicants jointly apply, which they can, yeah. then it is together. But if they uh, choose to apply on their own, then uh, we take them as they come in. Presumably, you use some copy paste from. Uh, if you had the same chemical before, you use. Uh, so the applicant could yeah. could copy paste from somebody else. They could, for instance, if you had applied and I do the same thing as you, I could, uh, of course, I could then get back to you and ask you whether I can use your application, mm -hmm. and you might sell the rights of using the application to me, and I can can hand in the same kind of dossier. Well, what about for the agency? If you get dozens of similar applications, you have to write the same, what do they call, broad information or use package. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You have to do the same thing like with them. Yes, yes, indeed. So there will be done several times the same calls to the public. And, and in this uh, public consultation, it is, uh, it's a call to everybody, uh, basically saying, well, uh, company X is applying for the substance with this and this use. Do you know anything about this? Do you want to let us know something about it? For instance, you could be a competitor and you could say, well, I'm doing the same thing and I do not use the substance. So w I don't see why you would grant an authorization to this company. Does that happen? That has happened in the past, yeah. It's not always so easy because very often, you know, the, the alternative providers they also do business with the applicant. So they might not necessarily have a business interest in announcing publicly that they don't want the applicant to get the authorization. But it has happened. Uh, more often we get, say, uh, feedback from NGOs who say, well, we know that this or that substance has been used for the same use and we don't see why such a use should be authorized any longer. I mean, some of you might be aware of this famous, infamous case of lead pigments in paints, where clearly there are other com uh, colors. And, and the question then is, of course, well, should we continue using these colors for specific uses, such as markings on, on, on the tarmac of, of uh, airports? Yes, no. And then it's a, a matter of, well, is this really now an alternative? 
that could substitute or not. Can I ask you, when it sure. comes to the information, when they, they submit the, the first kind of requirement, uh, is it complete information? How good are they to provide the full information that well, is requested? If we find that some, some sections are empty, we would not accept the, the application. We send it back to the applicant and we say, well, this is incomplete, we will not handle it. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's a completeness check, but it's not a check on content. So if they write complete rubbish into their application, we would still process it okay. at this time. Okay. Yeah. And then it's entering uh, also into the evaluation phase. So, so we are typically taking four to 10 months to help two expert committees, which are hosted by the agency, mm -hmm. the risk assessment committee and the socioeconomic analysis committee to develop opinions, which they will then submit to the decision-making phase in Brussels. So basically Brussels is delegating the impact assessment on these regulatory acts to the agency and the agency hosts these, com uh, these, these uh, expert committees uh, where the members are typically sent by member states. So for instance, uh, Swedish members are mostly recruited from, from uh, Chennai. And they come four times a year to Helsinki to discuss their opinions and to kind of ensure that they are consistent and that they come to the same kind of conclusions. And during a time, we might also be going back towards the applicant. If there is, for instance, a problem with, with an obvious problem with the file, and we do not uh, see immediately how we could, how we could uh, kind of make sense of what the applicant is writing there. We go back and we ask questions for clarification. We also have the possibility of, uh, of uh, having a trialogue, which is essentially um, uh, a meeting where the applicant is facing, for instance, uh, submitters in the public consultation and they discuss uh, together with the committee experts whether or not, for instance, an alternative is, is, is suitable or whether or not the costs are tremendous and how that all functions. So we, we tend to discuss this in, in, a, in a fashion where the, uh, the experts, our experts together with uh, the applicant and whoever intervenes in the, in the public consultation uh, have a meeting and, and, uh, and the, the, typically the output of that is also a bit to challenge the applicant. So then, based on that, we will write a draft or the, the experts will write a draft opinion which is then uh, given to the applicant for their commenting and uh, the, the experts may then revise their opinion or, or stick to their opinion and then f the final opinion is, is, is published after around about, well you see, after around about a year the final opinion is published and at the same time sent to Brussels where it's typically um, taking a little bit longer than six months to find a political decision whether or not to grant the authorization. Once the commission has decided and that's typically happening in a, in a comitology process together with the, um, with the member states. Then the authorization is, is running, the clock is ticking and they have a certain period of time until they have to reapply or stop using the substance. What's roughly the uh, rate of approval? <laughs> That's a very good question. So far we have approved all but one case. So, you might be saying, well, we haven't been strict, but you also have to see that, I mean, there is, a, there is a, uh, uh, an announcement, right? Way before there is a requirement for the authorization. And then firms typically pay 50,000 euros as an administrative fee to handle it. And they pay typically another 200,000 to prepare the dossier. So that's typically done by the consultant. So, so it's, it's, it's a substantial cost. And if you foresee that you have means to substitute anyways, well, there is not so much incentive than to have an authorization. So you, you would mostly apply if you really see a benefit in having the authorization. 
but you're right. I mean, this is one of the major criticisms that we are facing. Why is it that, uh, that everybody is basically recommended an authorization? Um, but let me go a little bit deeper into this later on when I speak about the sanctioning, because there is some sanctioning going on. All right, so, so that's, that's in a nutshell how the authorization process is working. Is that clear? Good. Well, what information do applicants typically submit? So, so they are obliged uh, to submit at least two pieces. One is this chemical safety report, which describes in detail the use of the substance and the risks arising from that use. So the use of the substance means, for instance, they have to say, well, in which steps actually is the substance used? What is the typical exposure uh, of workers or how much of the substance is, uh, is eventually emitted into the environment? They have to present modeling data where they cannot measure this uh, and they have to make a case for why they actually control the substance in a proper way. So that's typically in what we call the CSR, the chemical safety report. And the second bit which is obligatory is this analysis of alternative, which assesses substitutes to replace the substance uh, and compares them against other options such as, for instance, I'm moving out of Europe or I'm just shutting down or, um, yeah, so it's, the options that they have is basically to, to, uh, to describe what, what else they could be doing, right? So we want to see what's the best response the firm has to the situation where they are not getting an authorization. And the last part is not mandatory, but so far almost everybody has been submitting a socioeconomic analysis which is essentially a, a, a benefit cost analysis, only that sometimes it's difficult to quantify all of the impacts. So it's, it's, it's more like a, a, a say, semi-quantitative benefit cost analysis. And that describes what would be the societal impact if the applicant is no longer allowed to use the substance. And that's exactly where you pointed uh, to, uh, Jessica, that they very often ignore like, the, the benefits to the competitors of not granting an authorization to the applicant. Right? Because that, of course, opens up some market opportunity for the green firm to provide the same services that were provided by the dirty firm, if you like. All right. So, um, what happens then with the information in detail? Well, once submitted, the information is, as I said, subject to a consultation and it's also getting scrutinized by the two expert committees uh, and they have a rapporteur for each case and they write these opinions. Typically, these opinions are maybe 30 pages to 50 pages and they detail out what they think about the application and where they see weaknesses and what should be done, essentially what should be done. So in the end, they will recommend whether or not to grant the authorization, whether or not to recommend additional conditions for the use. That could be, for instance, that they recommend uh, additional risk management measures. So you, you get an authorization, but you must do this and this and that. Or it could be uh, the, that they require uh, measurement campaigns to be undertaken over the next years in order that if there is a reapplication, better data is available on exposure, those kind of things. Um, there are a number of common deficiencies, particularly with regard to the socioeconomic uh, information that is in these uh, applications. So a couple of years, uh, some colleagues of mine and I, we have been writing a, a kind of a essay paper on what are the typical problems that you observe in these in these uh, applications and well it's 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 very often such that firms do not necessarily understand the welfare perspective so they they are confusing impacts uh, that occur to them or that occur to others and in general they also have maybe not necessarily the skills uh, of, of kind of quantifying exactly what, what is needed uh, to be quantified. Um, sometimes 
so especially in the beginning we got things like you know well, we will lose this and this much um, uh, this and this much revenue but they would not necessarily report profits or they would claim profit losses but they wouldn't discount them or you know technical small technical errors that are maybe you know f to be expected if people do not necessarily know exactly what uh, can I ask I mean the first then there is a big or profitable market for consultants so usually the firms are not going to be do the ones doing this, this consultants yes right? that's correct and you guys have been giving a lot of kind of training how to do this uh, Yes, but uh, I mean, some of the consultants are also not that bad, and over time they have been picking up the skills of the trade, okay. if you like. But they are also, I mean, typically, the way consultancy works is you you have somebody for a couple of years. They are young. They come from a university. They do the consultancy job for a couple of years. They work 80 hours a week. Uh, and after a couple of years they move on to something else and then you restart the same thing with the same inexperienced crowd again, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense there is a turnover problem and, uh, and, and which is good because that generates also jobs for, for young people but it's, it's, uh, it's of course not necessarily helpful for the overall development of the, of the system. So, yeah. Um, Generally speaking, one can say that some of the deficiencies that are uh, spotted are due to a lack of effort. Others are due to ignorance or then you also have sometimes intentional misrepresentations. And as I said, if, if, if the committee spots such, such uh, problems, they will ask clarifying questions during the process, but one also has to understand that there is, of course, sometimes also, uh, or almost always, there will be some kind of balancing on behalf of the firm. So the firm will not basically randomly decide some, to not uh, report something or to report some things, but you can uh, actually press this whole decision uh, process of the firm into a standard um, principal agent model, if you like. So that's what we have been doing in this paper and the intuition, the intuition for the model that I'm going to present is very, very trivial. So the idea is that firms have an information advantage over the regulator because they know their business. They also know what they have tried in the past in order to substitute and where they failed and where it's promising and where some others might have succeeded already. So they know much more than the experts typically know. Of course, after having seen many of the same kind of applications, then also the expert catches up with, with reality, right? So there is a learning process going on. But especially if a substance is newly added, we, we have uh, not necessarily the technical knowledge to understand what, what could be done instead of using that substance. So the asymmetric information makes it costly to establish uh, whether a firm is compliant or not. And then firms may expect that monitoring uh, is, is imperfect and, and they may maximize along those lines. So the regulator will counter such incentives for moral, for moral hazard by imposing a cost whenever they detect a violation, they will have to have a sanction, otherwise, well, they will be cheated all the time. Firms introspect themselves and they check whether they are eligible for obtaining the authorization and then they decide how much and which details they want to disclose. And the more accurate information there is, the higher is the cost of effort and that makes firms pay more. And of course, you at the same time reduce the likelihood of being sanctioned. So it's really like this balancing between how much effort do I have to put in in order to get out what I want. Well, then forms, uh, you could say that firms just basically form an expectation over the sanction that they will face. And that's composed of the fine. And the fine in this sense is that they can maybe uh, get an authorization, but the length of authorization will be shorter than what they actually asked for. So suppose you ask for a 12 year authorization and I recommend only four years, then I'm basically forwarding a lot of reapplication costs already now. 
And so, of course, you could say, well, depending on the size of the firm, that might not be such a drama, but it's also that you create a lot of uncertainty, business uncertainty, because four years is maybe not very long in terms of having long-term contracts with your clients. So, so firms tend not to like these very short authorization periods. And they tend to put in some effort to convince the committees to recommend a longer period because that's giving them more certainty over their next business cycle. But I mean, that effort, it's like, uh, that effort can uh, lead to overstatements as well, right? I mean, the effort not necessarily reflects in a, a more accurate uh, yeah. um, uh, information, mm -hmm. right? So you need to be careful of not overdriving that effort because then you are like, uh, you are the regulator kind of increasing the cost of uh, regulating as well. Yeah, no, that's also true. I mean, that that is, uh, I mean, in this very simple model, what we then do is we, we say, okay, there will be some kind of a, uh, of a reporting standard and you need to put in so much effort that at least you do not fall short of that reporting standard. Okay. So if, you, if you're not putting sufficient effort, it will mean that you are increasing the likelihood of a, of a sanction. Mm -hmm. And also, if, if you are misreporting information, well, with some probability it will lead to, to a reduction in, 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 in the review period simply because you get caught, if you like. Yeah. So, so really like you have this expectation over the sanction and uh, well then there is the probability of being sanctioned which is dependent on the probability of getting detected. In this case this is relatively fixed, right, because well, Typically, each and every dossier will be studied in detail, so it's hard to escape that. And then the question is, what's the probability of being sanctioned if there is problems spotted in terms of either effort or in terms of misreporting? Well, so then you have this kind of function of violation of the reporting standards. And it's clear that, uh, well, the more effort you put into uh, the dossier and the less you are uh, misreporting, uh, the lower is the, the probability of having a sanction. Okay? Well, and then, well, they basically then have uh, the expected sanction which enters the applicant's profit function. Well, this is very standard, so you have the profit which depends on, on uh, the effort you put in and, and uh, the misreporting, so so typically, the less effort you put in, the higher your profit. The more you uh, misreport, uh, the less likely you have to represent. Uh, you have maybe to do less testing or less uh, air monitoring. So you you can save costs there as well um, by basically coming up with approximations, or you make some claims that are not necessarily substantiated. I'm just thinking about that model. I've been working with a similar model where we were trying to compare the incentive effects of having a a fine, like more criminal kind of punishment, okay. in some sense, on the one hand, and just a fee per unit on the other hand. Uh, so you could either have, like, there's a regulation, you break it, you get some ton of bricks coming down on you, like capital F, I suppose, maybe in your model there. Uh, or you could have, uh, depending on how much you, there's a sort of a per ton cost that you have to pay if you mm -hmm. pay too much. Have you, have you thought about that? Well, here I really try to mimic what's, what's going on in reality. And, uh, and in reality, we don't have the, 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 the legal powers to, to, uh, to find the applicant in terms of, of money. Right. So we are, we are not having any uh, enforcement authority that is delegated to the member states. And some member states, they have these uh, penalties and, and some, um, some have not. So that's why, why we haven't included this here. But uh, of course, you could have different, um, different means of sanctioning. Here, it's really such that uh, we, we have to find in terms of shortening the review period, um, which is a forwarding of additional costs for reapplication. Can I just ask, uh, based on reality, how many times have you shortened the, 
debate? Uh, well, I think it has been shortened in, in maybe 50 to 60 percent of the cases. I have to say, though, that a good chunk of those were um, shortenings where the applicant had really asked for very long periods and there has been an agreement that uh, we will not recommend more than 12 years. So then there is a default sanctioning which is not necessarily linked to the effort or to misreporting uh, but it's just that well, forecasting what the future will bring is very difficult over such long horizons. Yeah. So therefore all of the applicants who ask for say 20 years would automatically fall to 12 years. Hmm? But what's the average length of the decision? I mean, if it, think about the average. Length. Well, the average length, I think, at this uh, in this data set that I'm looking at is eight years, I think. Okay, so in principle, based on the twelve, that's kind of the default. You will kind of. Well, the de the, the, the say the 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 the, the normal authorization length on which the political masses have agreed is seven years. And then you have a kind of a other a shorter review period, which, which is typically four years. Mm -hmm. You also have to be careful not to have too short periods because then they become impractical. Yeah, then it's 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 the time, exactly, yeah. and then we would we would have just so much work to do to reassess and evaluate that it doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah? Sorry, question. Do you have any idea of how long it takes for the chemicals market to develop alternatives? Like in terms of 12 years, how, how fast do things change in the chemical? That really depends on the particular use. So, so sometimes, for instance, now we are dealing with, uh, with some substances which are called octophenols and nanophenols, and they, they are surfactants, uh, which are used, uh, for instance, for uh, virus uh, inactivation. In, uh, in drugs and in uh, influenza vaccination. We know that there are other surfactants. And what they are the surfactants? Well, they basically uh, are used to clean certain steps in the production. And for instance, they kill off the, or they open up, if you like, the protein shell of the, of the virus. And then you can, you can take out the, the, the DNA information which will make the virus grow. You close it again and you use that for vaccinating people. Now we know that there are alternatives. The problem is if you do have already a vaccine and you would have to change, you restart the whole development process because first you need to see that this works with your particular uh, vaccine. Then you have to do clinical studies. You have to reauthorize with EMMA and it takes eight to 12 years until you're done. Um, so then it's sometimes tricky, right? Uh, specifically, if it's not clear that it can be uh, whether or not it will work in your particular case. In other cases, it's much more easy and applicants themselves may be already on the way to substitute, but they need another four years or seven years or something uh, in order to finalize that, in order to re um, uh, re formulate something or recertify with their customers. Very often you have this problem that, you know, for the applicant themselves using a different substance is one thing, but their customers have certain specs and they need to basically demonstrate that they can meet those specs with the alternative substance as well. And if there is a decrement in performance, is that now relevant or not for the customer? So are they accepting small uh, reductions in, say, durability, yes or no. That depends, of course, then also in which segment of the market eventually the product will end up. So if you think of luxury cars and normal cars, if it is a small Fiat, maybe it's not so important whether the door handle lasts for five years or for seven years or for 10 years. But if you're buying a 90,000 euro Mercedes, then maybe the customer, or the final buyer wants to have the quality and therefore the, the, the customer of our supplier uh, of, of, of those parts mm -hmm. being Mercedes, they require certain quality standards. So it's, it's, not, it's not a yes or no answer or a very clear answer. It depends really on the case. 
Well, in any case, so if we return to, uh, to this model, then the first order uh, conditions here for expected profit maximization, they reveal the firm's best uh, answer. And, and it's clear the optimal effort is there where the marginal cost of effort just equals the marginal cost of uh, non-compliance. And similarly, honest reporting is optimal if uh, the benefit of misrepresentation, the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal uh, cost of uh, of non-compliance, so so very standard results, right? So that's that's giving you a flavor that indeed firms play a little bit with the effort that they're putting in, and it's not necessarily so that they're always very forthcoming with information. Um, now let me go to the data. So what we have is a relatively fat data sense, set in the sense that we have a lot of variables but not very many observations. So we have 141 observations but we have information that is use specific so the benefit of continued use as assessed uh, by the applicant and as evaluated by the committee. The monetized risk of continued use same as assessed by the applicant and as evaluated by the committee the individual risk levels, the number of workers exposed, the annual volumes of the substance used. Then we have application-specific information that uh, are uh, more the outcome of the evaluation process. So are there conditions additional to what is currently um, in place in terms of risk management measures, or do they have to have additional monitoring campaigns? We observe the type of application. Is it a downstream application versus an upstream application? So who is applying? Is it the manufacturer or the, the formulator? Or is it really the user of the chemical? Um, is it a case where the applicant is what we call bridging? So they have something in the pipeline, but it's just not good enough. Or is it more this case where it's very open? They don't have any substitute. And so they basically tell you, well, in the next decade, nothing will will happen and, uh, and there is also no information from the public consultation that would challenge that, that claim. And then the number and type of applicants, so are there small or medium sized enterprises or are there big companies, do they apply on their own or is it a consortium of applicants that join together to form a, uh, an application? Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask you that because I mean uh, this public consultation so I imagine that um, if you take all the substances, I mean, for some of them there will be quite some action regarding the public consultation, and for some of them there will not be so much action. Yeah. And that will have to do with the knowledge, the existing knowledge of the substance, right? Yes. So I mean, in a way, like the the effort is also kind of contingent on what is known uh, uh, scientifically, which is biased to certain kind of uh, chemicals. Well, yes. Of course, I mean, there are some uses of chemicals which are better known and better studied uh, than others. There's also some sectors which share more openly information. Now, I just mentioned these octophenol and nonophenol uh, substances. For instance, there is one, um, one basic um, surfactant commercial product which is called Triton X100, which is marketed by Dow Chemicals. So in principle, Dow Chemicals could have applied as an upstream and cover all of the European um, medical market. But it would have required that these companies like Pfizer or Eli Lilly or Roche or whoever, they would agree to jointly apply and they would have to exchange information. Now, pharmaceutical companies never exchange any information, uh, not even within the company, they are very reluctant to, to disclose any information of whatsoever, which makes that we got all of these applications as single individual company applications. That's good for the income of the agency, but it's maybe not what the regulator wanted in, in the beginning. And you really must be kind of co co constrained by very many security kind of rules, right? Because yeah, yeah, of course. There is a lot of there is a lot of confidentiality going on in these data. So, so we, we yeah. So we know about the the the, the EBIT 
the, the, the profits that are uh, that are made with a particular particular product uh, mm -hmm. that is information which which they would never disclose publicly. Mm -hmm. um, well, you also have substance-specific information such, such as what is it that they are really using, uh, in which kind of uh, purity or whatsoever, and then for which process are they using it? Is it for fabricating paints, or is it for coating, or is it for the production of, of drugs, or what is it that they are actually doing with the drug, uh, with the substance? And we have some time-specific information, so we know when exactly in the past they have submitted. And we know what review period they have requested and what review period they were recommended. Um, and so we also have some indicators of violation of reporting standards. Um, so we went through all of the opinions that were, were sent to the Commission and we looked at whether there were problems mentioned with the exposure assessment. And if so, we, we coded that as a one, and if not, as a zero. Whether there were problems with the, 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 the control of the risk. So, again, a binary variable. Whether there were problems with the analysis of alternatives. And then for the socioeconomic analysis, we define this continuous variable where we basically look at how much they have been overstating the net benefit of their continued use. So. The benefits that they claim, uh, th that they claim, minus the costs or the monetized risks that they claim, compared to what has been evaluated. And so, if there is no misreporting, then that will be one. And the larger the difference, um, well, the more uh, misreporting or, or um, violation of the standard is going on. So the opinion is the opinion of the committee that yes. evaluates. Yeah, exactly. And well, that is actually given as a number, right? Yes. So. That is a, that is a well. It's a ratio between the dollars or the euros here and the euros here. So so it starts from one and goes up to a certain level. In the empirical analysis, we 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 cut it off because there's some uh, some outliers which basically. Uh, well, if you have these very big uh, industry-wide applications, then it becomes so large that it's kind of uh, has too high leverage on on the on the, on the regressions. Mm -hmm. So we have to to cut it off at uh, at the ninetieth percentile. Yes. Is everything with socioeconomic analysis like monetized? Uh, not everything, no, and. Uh, Especially, so what, what they do monetize typically is profit losses to them and um, unemployment that could come out of uh, the, the non-authorization and then additional costs. Sometimes they, they claim things like, um, you know, they have to pay a penalty if they are not able to, to hold a contract um, and so on. And then some of this will be valid, and some of this will not be valid. And if it's not valid, then then it will be uh, it will be deducted here. Um, well, and then we observe whether or not a shorter period was recommended than requested. Yeah. So that's what we have in this set. And here I show you a correlation map between all the different uh, variables that we have in our data set, just so that you get a flavor. I mean, for instance, this gives you a flavor here. This is an indicator whether or not this was a downstream company. And you see that this is typically uh, negatively correlated with, with certain violations, for instance, uh, they typically, if they are downstream users, they know much better what they're actually doing, right? Because if you are an upstream applicant, you might not do what all of your customers are having in place. Whereas if you use the chemical yourself, you know exactly for what you're doing it, and therefore you have better means to report it, and you might also have to report it to national authorities, so you also have a, a history of, of measurements, and so on and so forth. So. 
the, the main message here is that there is some, uh, there is, there's some correlations that are, say, uh, observable. For instance, also, if you have uh, in the year 2014, we had very many uh, um, applications for Daniel's favorite substance, TCE, right? Because the sunset date was set at this, uh, this in this year. So then, then clearly there is a high correlation. So that's something we need to be aware of in the in the in the regression analysis, not to create uh, multicollinearity problems. Uh, but other than that, you see that most of, of, of the variables, they are uh, correlated to some degree, but it's not very strong correlation. Um, well, in the parametric analysis that I'm going to present, we employ two estimation strategies. Uh, so one is a very trivial linear probability model, which includes a firm character, uh, um, use characteristics, firm characteristics, an indicator for the, for the submission year, uh, and a constant. And then we also, well, we know that the linear probability model might not do very well, so we also estimate probit models uh, of a similar form where the f uh, represents the cumulative normal uh, function. Uh, one, one caveat here, so there's a compli complication because we have this one variable, which is the default sanctioning, which leads to a quasi-separation. And then we know that uh, there is a problem with linear, uh, with the, um, the maximum, li maximum likelihood estimator, it breaks down. So... Can you explain, I mean, if you want from, uh, you, if you want from 20, you got 12. Then, I mean, uh, but, uh, so, so... So every firm which, uh, which has a more, than 12. more than 12 will automatically be sanctioned. Okay. So that makes the, the maximum likelihood estimator break down. Okay. You so can computationally, you have a problem there. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's not stable. Okay. Uh, specifically, the standard errors will blow up. Mm -hmm. So one possibility to circumvent is to use a Bayesian estimator. And, and that, that works quite well. It obtains consistent coefficients even in, 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 in situations of complete separation, for instance. Yeah. So that's, that's what we do there. Um, and then before I'm going to show you the results, we also have this very simple non-parametric analysis where we, where we try to look into um, only the the impact of the violation in, uh, of the benefit cost analysis indicator. So what we do there is, essentially what we do is we build a, a moving average. Um, we trace the fraction of the sanctioned applications at any threshold tau uh, on, this, uh, on this interval between one and the cutoff value of 28 that I mentioned. So, and then we see what is the fraction of firms that have been sanctioned at each exaggeration level. And so the idea would be that, well, as, as, uh, as tau is increasing, you are, uh, you are uh, exaggerating the net benefit ever more, and you should see actually an increment and also in the fraction of, of companies that get sanctions. And, and it's, I know this is a bit complex to explain. I have not found out the best way to explain it, but it's maybe easier if you'll see the results. So what, what's going on is that here at one, this is where, where you don't have any misrepresentation in the socioeconomic information. And if you move to the left, then that means you're ever more exaggerating. And clearly you see here an ex uh, a, a, a strong increment which is then at around four or five leveling out, or leveling off. And one of the reasons for that, or one of the explanations for that observation is that um, maybe at some moment, while well, it's clear that you have misrepresented the data, uh, the socioeconomic uh, impacts, but then there might be other things uh, going on as well. Typically, if you are misrepresenting your, your um, you use this in such a way, you also have other violations of the reporting standards. Can I, can I ask, is a VCA, was it like the relative? 
or is it absolute? Because it's like again, like we were discussing in the morning. What what matters? Well, this is this is just basically the relative. But the absolute should matter as well, right? Because it's very different when you are uh, misreporting three million dollars and when you are reporting three hundred thousand. Uh, well. Yes, but for the accuracy of the information you provide, it might not be as relevant. Right? In a sense that you are, if you're clearly, if you use, should matter, right? Because the, the larger is absolute value, the more you have to gain from misreporting. No, that's true. I mean, I could try plot this uh, also with the absolute values. I would have to see. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I could basically just take the net benefit of the opinion minus the net benefit of the mm -hmm. of the application, and then or the other way around, and then plot it. That yeah, way. because here you are kind of losing the scale effect, and it, it should matter. I mean, if you have three minutes to lose, of course. Mm. Uh, but uh, I mean, if if that holds, you should also see a similar pattern. I mean, but it's sharper, maybe. Maybe sharper. That, yeah. yeah, but that's a good uh, good comment. I can mm -hmm. I can certainly add that. Thanks. So, well, as I said, well, what we just saw in these moving fraction graphs, clearly there is an increase before leveling off at around uh, four, and that suggests that then maybe other factors become more relevant for the, the decision whether to sanction or not. In other words, at a certain level of misreporting, uh, well, the actual size or, 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 or not size, but the uh, relative size of, of net benefits are no longer so relevant for this decision, and uh, and clearly, then we need to have parametric methods to to see what are the interactions between the different violations that are going on. And here are the results for the for the linear probability model. And what we have included here as violation variables is first of all it's VBCA, and then the VBCA squared and then the other indicator dummies. And what you see is that this one is positive and significant, this one is negative and smaller and significant, and so what you get is a shape which is inverse U-shaped. Uh, and that also kind of, uh, well, is, I think, consistent with, the, with this graph that at some moment it you know, if you if you make a prediction about whether or not there is an increment in the likelihood of being sanctioned, you don't find that increment anymore. And certainly, there are other uh, other factors that are much more relevant for the decision whether or not to sanction, such as, for instance, violations in of the reporting standard on alternatives. So clearly, here you see this is a much bigger coefficient than than uh, the violation on on the on the socioeconomic information. So that's something which the committees have been relatively severely punishing. So here so it's a it's of zero one. You are yes. sanctioned or not? Yes. So but how many of your observations are sanctioned? Uh, well, that's a good question. I think it's as I said, I think including the default sanctioning, around sixty percent. Okay. But then you could run um, more like a continuous uh, kind of regression of the, the magnitude of the sanctioning. Would yes, that? but typically what happens is that you would basically just fall from, say, you apply for eight uh, for seven years, you fall to four years. You apply for twelve years, you fall to seven years. You apply for twenty years, you fall to twelve years. So that's a bit of a difficulty. Because. Because it's not telling you much, because the difference uh, will not be very different. If you fall from 12 to 7, it's 5 years. Okay, then it would be 5 years. And if you fall from 7 to 4, it would be 3 years. But that's about it. There's not, there's not many who have been applying for, for years outside of that scheme. But that could you control for the number of years they apply in the first place, right? Could you, could you do that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the difference in, or you mean I would regress on the number of years that are recommended in the in the end, uh, or in the in the initial request as well, right? If but it must be the difference between what they ask for and yeah. what they get. But that That's will be more or less always more or less the same number of years. Right. 
But so then that, that is in the dependent the depend variable, but you cannot have any control on the initial requests? I could potentially include also uh, what has been applied for in, in the regression, but I think it would be relatively highly correlated with, for instance, uh, the default variable. Right? Okay. So the default is basically saying whether or not some, somebody applied for more than 12 years. Then you see also that the magnitude of the individual risk level that the committees eventually detect has also a little bit of an influence. There were some year effects in the linear probability models. Some substances were treated a bit differently, apparently. And some functions of substances were also treated a bit differently. This all vanishes when we go to the probit model, except for the violations which we still uh, see. So we report that in average uh, partial effects so, so that it is comparable to the, to the linear uh, model and has the same interpretation more or less. And you see that the, the effects are a bit less pronounced. But we also find that you have a clearly higher effect of the, of the alternative uh, reporting violation and this default will still be quite influential. All right, um, well, let me, let me summarize what you, what you just saw. Well, the results of both uh, analyses suggest an inverse U-shaped effect of misreporting of the socioeconomic information on the likelihood of a sanctioning. And this confirms the non-parametric results uh, and persists even when you control for some of these other uh, things that are going on, uh, violations of other standards. Um, one possibility is that a large violation of the socioeconomic information uh, standard um, was more often observed for these big upstream applications where things are more uncertain and therefore it is more difficult to actually accurately quantify and maybe also the expert committees were a little bit less reluctant to buy into the arguments of, of, of the applicant because it is less clear what actually is going on at the firm level. And so that might be that uh, that was crowding out the attention a little bit, if you like. Um, and we find, or you can interpret, that this explanation is corroborated by, by the significant coefficient on, on these other um, violating uh, indicators. Well, as I said, the main results then mean that, as predicted by theory, you, 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 you can see a negative relationship between effort and honesty of applicants and the probability of having a sanction which means also that uh, overstating of benefits and understating of the risks has had an impact, but it was modest compared to, to problems in other parts of the authorization. And, and these other parts are mainly the, the availability of alternatives and, and, and part, uh, partly also the risk control concerns. But in some sense, I mean, if you like, we have been criticized uh, heavily by, by NGOs, by members of the European Parliament, uh, because there are several methodological shortcomings in these authorization requests. Uh, that's, that's clear. But, uh, but on the other hand, if we now analyze this very detailedly, then we have been creating at least some incentive to report adequately by, 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 by punishing firms that are not accurately reporting. So it, it, it suggests, and maybe that is now my, my interpretation as, as, a, as an agent of the agency, uh, that, uh, that we have been able to create at least some kind of a, a structure of incentivizing honest and accurate reporting. Yeah, well, in that sense, I'm through my slides, and if there are questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Okay, um, thank you very much.